Hey everybody, welcome back to the Lust is Boring podcast. Uh, a couple of weeks ago we did an episode on St. John Paul II, his five loves, and we broke down one of them. Uh, today we're going to revisit that topic, uh, focusing on John Paul's love of human love. We've got Dr. Andrew Swafford from Benedictine University that's going to help us break open the wisdom that John Paul has given the church when it comes to understanding human love. We actually, um, the chastity ministry, we just got back from Poland doing our first ever pilgrimage there. Uh, several of you listeners were able to come with us. It was an extraordinary week or so. We got to go to Warsaw, down to Czestochowa, to Poland, to the Shrine of Divine Mercy. Uh, I think my favorite part, we got to hike in the Tatra Mountains where John Paul II used to go. We actually hiked on the John Paul II trail. I brought a copy of the Holy Father's book that he wrote when he was a bishop called Love and Responsibility. And we sat up in the mountains and spent just a half hour pouring through about 30 of my favorite excerpts from that passage. I mean, there's no better classroom uh, than, than the mountains of Poland to teach what came from the heart of St. John Paul II. While we were on this trip, uh, we got to go to Varavica, which is the Holy Father's uh, birthplace, and there's a beautiful museum uh, basically in his house. And while we were there, I found this quote that I had never seen before from one of the young people that he knew well. And a college student, female, listen to this. She said, I was coming back from class on a hot afternoon, and I entered St. Florian's church to rest inside the coolness inside. And then I heard a rustle of sheets of paper. I looked back. A priest was sitting in the confessional, John Paul, on the right and reading something under a small lamp. I don't know how it happened that I went. I know I must have, I, mu I needed to go. And I knelt at the confessional. And then there was the confession. Unlike all the ones I've gone to before, something in me broke. I understood that I couldn't live like that anymore, that I had to begin to have an inner life, that I had to want something, desire something, that I had to start something with God and learn to listen to what he was saying as well. I can still hear the words of the priest whispered at the end, come again. This was John Paul's gentle pastoral love that was a magnet to young people. And thanks be to God, we were able to spend a week basking in his teachings, travel around Poland. Um, if you do want to come with us on our next pilgrimage, sign up at chastity.com. We're going to be going to Mexico City on the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, December 12th. I remember a couple years ago to be in El Paso on her feast day. And I went into a church for a morning mass. It was like 6 or 7 a.m. And I thought, you know, how many people are going to be there? I walk inside this church. It, all the lights are off. There's about 800 people in the church with candlelight, and there's a mariachi band standing in front of the Tilma of Our Lady of Guadalupe, serenading her, singing to the Virgin Mary on her feast day. That's El Paso. I can't even imagine what Mexico City is going to be like on her feast day. And so if you want to come, sign up. It's about a week-long trip. We're going to be visiting the different spots in Mexico City, spending time there at the, uh, the Basilica, and then spending a day of service working with uh, poor orphans there in Mexico City as well. So if you want to sign up, check that out while well, spots are still open. Look forward to going with you there. Now, today's show... As I mentioned, we're going to dive into the riches of St. John Paul II's teaching on human love. And joining me to discuss this is Dr. Andrew Swafford. He's an assistant professor of theology at Benedictine College, co-author and co-presenter of What We Believe, the Beauty of the Catholic Faith, together with Dr. Marcellino D'Ambrosio and Dr. Swafford's wife, Sarah Swafford, who wrote this awesome book, Emotional Virtue. Um, Andrew heads, holds a doctorate in sacred theology from the University of St. Mary of the Lake, master's degree in Old Testament and Semitic languages from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Dr. Swafford lives with his wife, Sarah, and their five kids in Atchison, Kansas. Doc Swaff, thank you for coming on the show. Hi, it's so good to be here, Jason. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's good, good to be with you. Uh, what is it like there at Benedictine getting to teach young people the teachings on St. John Paul II? Oh my gosh. Well, it's fun listening to you talk about coming home from Poland and just what a great, great place. And uh, you know, it's a lot of fun. I mean, you think about our students now. I mean, we're in 2022, right? So they were pretty young when yeah. he died in 2005. And so, um, you know, they, they know of him. They many of them think highly of him, um, but they don't know the man. They don't know his mm -hmm. human story. And that's one of the things I like to share with them the most is just kind of get to know his human story. And then his ideas, as you know, Jason, they, they just pop so much <laughs> louder and clearer. And they mean so much more when you know the context in which he wrote these and thought about these and gave these uh, these things to us. Yeah, when he was a young priest, I remember he said that when I was a young priest, he learned to love human love. 
And so these young people's problems with life and love became his problems, his issues. And so they'd go on these hikes and they'd pair off with him, whether it's on a train there or on a kayak or on the trail. And they'd, they'd call him Vujek, you know, which means uncle, because it was illegal at that time under communist regime for him to be doing this with the kids, because the communists would see it as kind of a cell of resistance against their t tyrannical regime. And so John Paul was spending time with the young people at the risk of his life. That's how much... He loved him and the kids would kind of peel off to spend time with him, the young adults, newlyweds, engaged couples. And they'd ask him these deep, well, what, what should I do here? And, and I remember them saying he would always leave them with this phrase, but you must decide. He always gave it back to them like a good spiritual director, not telling them what to do, but asking them these questions, probing the depths of their heart. What is it that they ultimately long for? And then leaving the full weight of the responsibility of that decision for the, their vocation in their hands. And so we had just this gift of not arguing kind of from the outside in, here's the rules, gotta follow them, but more from the inside out. And I think especially with young people, college students, they resonate with that personalistic approach. They, they do so much. I mean, every I've been teaching this class for five or six years now. And one semester that stands out a ton is in spring of 2018, where I taught uh, Benedictine has a campus in Florence, Italy. And so we had 48 students in Florence. And I taught my class on JP2 and had four kids at the time. And um, same thing. They, they, you know, they, they knew of him, didn't know the man, and they just fell head over heels in love with him. Mm -hmm. And the quote you mentioned earlier uh, in St. Florian's, I mean, just his the combination of his tenderness, mm -hmm. his warmth. I mean, the, the people, the young people that hung out with him, they said we could ask him anything. Nothing was off the table. And yet he wasn't, they say, he wasn't simply a buddy. We wanted to be like him, that he loved them enough to also speak the hard truths. Mm -hmm. And this combination of love and tenderness and the conviction of a father um, transformed them. And the same thing happened with our students. I and mean, we just got to know these students so well. We got to go to Poland and Krakow and kind of relive the story on site. And you know, they knew the story about St. Florian's, um, which is where John Paul II was stationed in 1949 after he got his doctorate, he finished his doctorate, went to a rural parish and then St. Florian's. And that, in many ways, as George Weigel, and you've got a great book on this, that's where World Youth Day began. Like, mm -hmm. that's where he came to love human love. And, you know, he, he uh, gathered a choir initially with these college students. And when my students got there, they raced up to that choir because they wanted to be where the magic happened. And they knew that six of that original choir, three couples, came, three married couples, came out of that. And it, you, you don't catch fire and, and fall in love with Jesus to find a spouse by any means. Mm. But you know, when people run on fire to Jesus, these things tend to start happening on an accident. And our students just, you know, we, we actually, so get this, we've had three marriages come out of that semester in Florence, none of whom were <laughs> dating at the time, but they just, and, and some of them were in serious relationships with other people that they had to get out of. Mm -hmm. And these conversions happening and, and, you know, it led to us doing marriage prep with some of these these uh, couples. And so I just love teaching on JP2 um, this, you know, especially to the next generation. They don't know his story. They don't know about communism. They don't know what it was like. And, mm -hmm. and when they do, they're like, wow, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And uh, we need to kind of relight that same fire that he did then uh, right now. It just lights. I mean, they just get so excited. Yeah, because when you learn about him, I mean, it's it's hard not to fall in love with the guy. I mean, the, the communists at first actually wanted him to become bishop because they kind of thought of him as kind of a young intellectual, wouldn't be much of a threat. But eventually it became pretty apparent, like, OK, this guy's going to be a problem. And so they, you know, they put spies right across the street sitting in their car. They oh, yeah. tap the wires of his phones. And, and when he'd go anywhere, they would tail him, the, you know, these two spies. And it came to the point where if he really had to have a secret meeting or go camp with the young people, they would actually have a separate car range that, you know, his driver would do maneuvers, turn around the car corner. He would jump out, hop into the other car, go in a different direction. You know, one of the young people on our pilgrims like, man, boss move. You know, just it's like 007 kind of stuff going on. But, you know, I mean, he, they, these guys were spying on him. They had like dozens of cartons full of information of, you know, who purchased, you know, his, his groceries, you know, where he got his underwear, how often he went to the dentist, like just insane amounts of details on the minutia of this guy's life. And and he knew they were tapping his lines and listening to every conversation in the bishop's residence there. So he would actually talk to them about the philosophical faults of Marxism and why it's so weak intellectually, because <laughs> he, he would just give them homilies because he knows someone's on the other line tuning in. Right. But but just this, this boldness that he had towards them, he wasn't intimidated because he knew who his right. real judge was. But then with the young people, they said, they said he was happy and demanding. And that, that combo is potent. This guy's that not just like this curmudgeon, this you know, grim bear of the glad tidings, but this guy who's just genuinely happy 
but he'll say what needs to be said. And I think the kids respected him because he wasn't pandering to them. You know, he knew they were capable of greatness and of being these new saints, the new millennium. Yeah, no, Amen. My, uh, Sarah, you know, who, you know, both of us, my wife, uh, she likes to call JP2 the Catholic homecoming king. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> that is exactly right. And, you know, and, and the whole communist context, I mean, like you're talking about, they said there's 75,000 informants, like like spies, your neighbors, your coworkers that would report, an, you know, an untoward comment that you made. And the more that, you know, I, I share with, uh, Havel's, Václav Havel's Green Grocer parable, uh, which kind of gives a, a sense of the ethos of communism in terms of, how it was built upon fear. Everybody was afraid. They thought they were alone. They're the only ones who still care about their faith. And the more you think you're alone, you just get in line and you compromise and you're obedient. And um, and the more they saw that, like, gosh, I mean, it's not that we have the exact same thing. No one's saying that. But the whole notion of cancel culture and this kind of ideological conformity and, you know, if you you don't toe the line in the right way on social media or what have you, you'll be ostracized in Mm -hmm. some way. And um, you know, what happened is he took those students out into the, the mountains, into the woods and um, create, as they describe it, that was a zone of freedom where they could really be themselves, build friendships based on their deepest convictions infused by the faith. And, and that's what when I whenever I teach classes on this, I mean, the students gravitate toward that. And they're like, I want to build friendships based on that. I want to really run and run on fire together with other people who want to do the same thing. So give us a little background then on love and responsibility, starting with that work. Uh, a little background of wh- where this thing came from. Give us some info on that. So, you know, that, that group of students that he gathered, uh, they eventually, they called themselves at first Radzinka, which means little family. But then the name that stuck is Shortovisko, which means environment. Uh, but JP2 preferred milieu. Uh, mm-hmm. and it, it, that Shortovisko, this, this group of young people, became this zone of freedom where they they could actually breathe and and breathe their Catholic faith and and do so together. And there's stories about how college students wouldn't even share last names with each other because you didn't know who you could trust. You were always afraid. But in Shorto Visco, when they gathered with Wojtyla, they could relax, they could be themselves, they could enter deeply into the faith. This group from 1953 to 78 went on a two-week kayaking trip every single year until he became Pope. And initially it was these college students, but then they got married and had kids and eventually their kids came. And in some cases, by the end of his life, he got to know their grandkids. So into the hundreds, this incredible community that started St. Florian's right there in Krakow. Um, so when now, OK, so when does love and responsibility come out in 1960? So 10 years after this is happening, uh, you know, by 54, he's teaching at the Catholic University of Lublin. Uh, he's teaching classes called Love and Responsibility. But, but here's the thing that my students really just, they, they can't believe it. Love and Responsibility is a book that comes out of the encounter, the interaction of him teaching the truth and him being with and accompanying these young people, hearing their problems, hearing their heart, and proposing solutions in accordance with the gospel, that these aren't just ideas. This is the fruit of a pastor uh, who loves these kids, loves these people, and loves them enough to be both happy, as you say, but also demanding. Mm-hmm. It calls them to the greatness that deep down they really want. Uh, and so the book that comes out the same time as this actually is, is Jewelers Shop, same year, mm-hmm. 1960. And he described Jewelers Shop as, uh, so it's a play if those who haven't read it. Uh, I don't want to say too much because it is it is absolutely worth your read. I love it more every time mm-hmm. I read it. Um, but he called that his debt to Shortovisco. And some of the Shorty School members, when they read Jewelers Shop, it's about these three couples. And it's really, it's not preachy. It's about human love. It's a lot of the same themes in Eleanor, but in a very just realistic way, just the the, the human messiness of relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, and they said that they could hear themselves in the story, that Boitiwa had a knack for recalling conversations decades after they happened. Yeah. And no one character in Jewelers Shop is a Shorty School character. Um, but they... This, this all came out of the fruit of his time with these young people. These are not just ideas. It's not heavy handed. It's a pastor in love with his flock. Now, if you had to distill love and responsibility, um, kind of the, the thesis, you know, the, the launching point, what he's trying to get across um, when you teach it to young people, what do you think is kind of the thesis of what John Paul wanted to leave the church with that? I mean, I think one of the most powerful ways is how he began it uh, when he mentions what's going on here really is a matter of introducing love into love. Introducing divine love, capital L love, agape love. What happens when eros, a romantic, uh, the erotic, what happens when that is infused and informed and transformed 
by divine love. So uh, I, I love kind of – that's kind of the whole book in a nutshell once you unpack it. Um, but really the interplay of how love – you know, when you – how does it begin, right? You're attracted to someone, you might click, there's chemistry. That all gets out in front first. Um, but real love can't be simply a feeling or an experience. It's got to be a commitment to the good of the other. And that takes more time to develop. The wheel's got to kind of catch up to the emotions mm -hmm. and the attraction. And one line that I, I mean, there's so many golden gems in there. But where he says at one point that love never is but only constantly becomes depending upon the contribution of each person. Meaning mm -hmm. if I only bring a consumer mentality to it and you only bring a consumer mentality to it, then all we're going to do is use each other. Mm -hmm. But if I bring something more, if I bring gift love, not taking love, if I want to make a gift of myself and I want to not simply desire you as a good for me, but desire your good first and mm -hmm. foremost, then that is transforming this love that is never static, but is always either growing or it could be regressing. And the other thing I love so much is the interplay between, I think Catholics sometimes are like, oh, the culture thinks love is an emotion, it's a feeling, and we say it's an act of the will. <laughs> well, what you get in Voitiwa so clearly is, yes, it's got to be rooted in an act of the will. It's got to be built upon that foundation. But once you have that, you need to positively nurture and foster the emotional connection. It's not about suppressing that. It's about no. contextualizing it in a way that comports with the dignity of the person. Yeah, that, that's the beauty of it, that he's not trying to like just shun the emotions and say, no, 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 that, that's not real love. This is love. You know, he, right. he talks, you know, you were talking about the different types of love. And I think young people are always wondering, is this love? How do I know this is the one? What is love? Am I just in love? And he gives us such a clear walkthrough of like, well, first we have that love as attraction. And so that's a good thing. Right. It's not love completely, but that's the start. You've got the, it's the, the raw material, so to speak. And then you, right. you build upon that love as attraction, love as desire. I mean, if you're attracted to someone, you want union, you desire that. But if it right. ends there, then it's simply egoism. You're desiring the other as a good, as you had mentioned. It has to evolve past that to love as goodwill. Um, but then he takes it a step even further than that to betroth or spousal love where you make a complete gift of yourself to the other. And, and kind of when he lays out that framework, you can see yourself in those stages and realize, okay, where am I? You know, am I stuck in love as attraction or love as desire? And I haven't really gotten the point into love as goodwill. Because what happens when those emotional or sensual reactions kind of fade? There's a section I want to read from John Paul II out of Love Responsibility, one of my favorites. He says, and you can kind of commentate on this, he says that the essential reason for choosing a person must be personal, not merely sexual. Life will determine the value of a choice and the value and true magnitude of love. It is put to the test most severely when the sensual and emotional reactions themselves grow weaker and sexual values as such lose their effect. Nothing then remains except the value of the person and the inner truth about the love of those connected comes to light. If their love is a true gift of self so that they belong to the other, it will not only survive but grow stronger and sink deeper roots. Whereas if it was nothing more, Never more than a sort of synchronization of sensual and emotional experiences. It will lose its raison d'etre, its reason for existence, and the persons involved in it will suddenly find themselves in a vacuum. We must never forget that only when love between human beings is put to the test can its true value be seen. And, and this kind of echoes a line from the jeweler shop that love is a constant challenge thrown to us by God. And so, uh, and so it's a task at the end of the day. But maybe comment on that. It just, I mean, there's so much, I mean, you could spend an hour and a half distilling the wisdom of this because so many people get to the point where the fumes of sensual attraction dissipate and then they're left with, what do we have here? What is the actual value of the choice of the person? Was I pursuing the person or was I pursuing the emotional or sensual gratification I was getting at the expense of the person? So dive in on that. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. There's, uh, you know, near that uh, section, there's a point where he says, sometimes uh, you have a, a surplus of raw material, intense attraction and chemistry, but not a great love is formed. It just gets consumed and burnt out. And sometimes you have a truly great love formed on only, as he puts it, modest material. And in the margin, I wrote Hollywood, your grandparents. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just, you know, it's just the first thing that came to mind. But you're, mm -hmm. you know, that testing, you're right. And it's not like a negative thing. It's Life will test the depth of our love. Mm -hmm. uh, time will test this, not in like a, a you know, a, I'm going to get you away, but just no, the truth of what's there will come unveiled by the end. 
Um, and I like to think of it as, as an athlete, you know, you and I were both athletes. Um, we talk about that second wind, right? So it's because I, I, for you know, young people need to hear that marriage is not easy. That marriage takes effort. Um, that when you, when, when married couples are, you know, celebrating their 60th year anniversary, it's not luck. It's not, Oh, I'm glad you found the right person. I mean, that, there's a grain of truth there, but it's also what they brought to the relationship. Um, but I also don't want to give them the impression that you're just going to grit your teeth and grind it out and hate because the reality is it's like an athlete that pushes through that second win. The spiritual life can be the same. Um, yes, that kind of superficial stuff that's really fast uh, up front, that's going to ch- change. It can't mm-hmm. stay as it is forever. But that doesn't mean that attraction and emotional connection go away. What happens is they get deeper. Um, maybe just to connect this to um, another place where he you know, he talks about the danger of just purely emotional love as idealization. You get love mm-hmm. goggles. Uh, it, it, it impacts my memory and imagination. But then once you re- the other thing, too, is when you're idealizing the person, who are you falling in love with? Is that the real person or is this the person of your imagination? And when that hits the hard rock of reality, you all, you know, the phrase uh, a cynic is just a disappointed romantic. Yeah. Um, whereas this kind of love, when it's tested and it stays the course, you end up, as he puts it later, having emotional, affective love for not the person of your imagination, but the real person. Mm-hmm. Your emotions become more sober and serene and not fickle and stable. And you even love the person not of your imagination, but the person who they really are, their flaws and all. And so I guess what I'm getting at is this testing is necessary for the development of love, but it doesn't mean goodbye emotions, goodbye attraction, as you said earlier. It means those very things will be deepened and enriched and transformed and transfigured. And so you really can, what he's giving us is you you absolutely can have your cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. You want the greatest experience sexually, emotionally, I'll give it to you. But you got to take the leap with me. You got to go through the crucifixion first, and you'll find yourself coming out the resurrection on the other side. Yeah, I, mean, I often hear the this objection. Well, you know, when it comes to chastity and all this stuff, well, you know, it's kind of naive not to be sexually intimate prior to marriage because then how are you even going to know if you guys are compatible in the bedroom or not? You know, that's really naive. You're just going to wake up one day and, and marriage realize, oh my goodness, you know, we're not compatible sexually. And I, one thing I always say back to that is like, well. I think the real danger is what if you are sexually compatible before marriage, tremendously sexually compatible and so sexually compatible that it overshadows the fact that you're not personally compatible because it's so easy to bury your problems underneath sex. And so John Paul II dives into this and talking about how often the sensuality will cover up an absence of love that has failed to develop. Whereas if you don't have the clouding effects of sexual intimacy in your relationship, you're forced to look at your relationship with 2020 vision because you don't have those goggles of sensuality on you because inside of marriage, having clouded judgment is really helpful, you know, where you're not as critical of one another. But before marriage, that's the most dangerous time to cloud your judgment. And this is not to say that some couples don't struggle with sexual compatibility in marriage, but if they're willing to make that much of a sacrifice prior to marriage, I'm sure within marriage, they'll be able to figure that out, even if it involves going to counseling and working through things like that. But if they're unwilling to practice the patience and self-restraint necessary to practice chastity beforehand, even if they have the greatest fireworks in the bedroom, that's not the stuff that's going to sustain you in the long haul. That's not the type. That's like, you know, to use an office example of this, like Michael Scott eating Alfredo, you know, chicken Alfredo before a marathon. It's not not really what you want to fuel up your tank with before going on a long run. That's not going to sustain you. It's going to backfire in a bit. And so maybe dive into a bit of, of, of how sensuality clouds our judgment, whereas chastity gives us greater, greater clarity of vision. Oh, it's I mean, it's so true. I mean, when he dresses chastity at one point, he says, you know, here's one of the biggest objections against chastity is it, it's a it's a foe of love. It's a hindrance of love. Yeah. He's like, well, if by love you only mean a physical and emotional experience, then you're right. But if you mean by love, not simply that, but if something rooted in the will that's gift love, that's spousal love, then chastity is not only not only is it not a foe, it's the prerequisite friend that makes it happen. Because, as you say, that the depth of that kind of love takes time. Mm-hmm. Whereas when you enter sexually um, early on, what happens is that 
I mean, again, I know that there are people that in hard situations and they're, they're striving. So no one's ever too far gone. But the reality is it actually arrests the development of your love. It actually freezes mm -hmm. the development of love. It, it prevents it from going deeper because it gets stuck at those more superficial levels. Um, I like to say that sex is it, just what you said is a binding and blinding. Like makeup yeah. sex is a real thing. Like this yeah. isn't just made up out of nowhere. Like it, it, and we've all seen couples that respectfully it's like why are they still together i mean it looks like they're just fighting all the time and it, you know and, and you know i don't know the situations we're just talking about hypotheticals but probably a relationship like that would not be sustained month after month year after year if it were not also sexually active mm -hmm. um but what's going to be there you know what 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 are they really there's a line in jewish shop when the mother is talking about the the christopher and monica this sons what are you building my children like what kind of love are you building? And that's really the question is, what kind of a love do we want? If you mm -hmm. want the kind of love that he's talking about, that Christ talks about, that is total and radical gift love, chastity is the prerequisite. I mean, if someone is willing to fight that battle for you, what can't they do for you? Yeah. They could do anything for you. And you're right. I mean, can couples still have trouble sexually uh, after marriage? Well, yeah, but the key to, to, the key to marital intimacy is that it's not just pleasure. The key to marital intimacy in a real way is what happens in the bedroom is the outworking of the self-gift that we're giving to each other throughout the entire course of the day. And that doesn't mean there won't be hiccups. That doesn't mean that might not need counseling, things like that. But it does mean we're entering into this dynamic to be selfless lovers. Yeah. And the whole point, I mean, JPT uses the word, their uh, concept fruwi in LNR and fruwi as enjoyment or pleasure. And what he means is when things are in conformity with their, the right order of things, the natural order, in marriage, open to life, then the ecstasy, the pleasure, the, the erotic, that's all holy and good. And yeah. so when you become a selfless lover, you're attentive to those things, um, but in the context of self-gift. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I just exactly right. It's hard to live out. It's easy to say, I get it. But it, it's, I mean, what else in life that is really worth it? doesn't come with sacrifice. The same yeah. thing is true. What kind of a love do we want? Yeah, so in summary, a person will make love as they love. And so if their love is self-absorbed and, and selfish or aggressive or impatient, that's gonna translate to the bedroom. But if a person's love is virtuous where they will the good of the other, virtue works pretty well in the bedroom. And a lot of people think, oh no, that's you know religiosity and Victorian prudishness and it's just a wet blanket and a cold shower and they see it as repressive but but what if virtue is actually caring for the needs of the other being attentive to their desires and their preferences and things like that like what if you have two virtuous spouses going into it it's like wow that that that's real intimacy the into me see whereas lust is a reduction of the person to their sexual value that purity of heart enables you to truly be close to each other and it's a shame that people don't get this because he, he kind of talks about love and responsibility and you can elucidate on this a little bit um how people resent chastity that it, it, they they actually kind of yeah. want to characterize it is unhealthy and neurotic and so deny it the good that it deserves so that it can kind of lightheartedly pass by this thing and prefer what's comfortable and convenient so maybe dive in a little bit uh, on uh -huh. his treatment of the resentment of chastity well, if I could just go back just real quick, and I'll be fast, uh, on just what you are saying earlier. I mean, so, yes, again, love has to be rooted in the act of the will, total gift. But when we do that, then we want to be attentive to the physical needs and desires and preferences of the other in the bedroom, but also their emotions, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and this is where men and women are similar, but can be different. And so, uh, in some ways, you know, this isn't always the case, but for a lot of women, foreplay is not just like in the bedroom. Foreplay is like when you did the dishes. Foreplay yeah. is when you were like emotionally attentive to me. You listened to me. You cared for me. You anticipated my needs. So yeah. JP2's whole vision for love is to be attentive at all these different layers and connect at all these different layers. Yeah. I yeah. love that section. Where we, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of people don't realize how, how detailed he gets in love and responsibility. If there's any kids listening yeah. right now, send them over to the next room to listen to Paw Patrol. But he actually gets to the point where he talks about it being virtuous uh, for the man as much as possible to to time the climax together with the wife. And, you know, he goes into detail on this. That's Absolutely. an act of virtue on behalf of yes. the man to be attentive to her curve. Eyes, flip <laughs> yeah. yeah, for her curve of sexual arousal being distinct from his and him being kind of attentive with tenderness towards the woman in this act. And like, 
you know, women hear this thing, it's like, wait a minute, I was told that like the church's bishops and clergy are, are just like repressive, neurotic, celibate old men who don't know anything. And all of a sudden there were students of his females saying, no, he must have been married before, surely at least engaged. Like, how does he get this stuff? Well, he gets right. it because he's an awesome listener. Well, and, and he said, you know, he takes that objection on uh, early on in the book. He's like, and you might say, what's a celibate doing talking about this? And like, he's like, I don't have direct experience. You're right. But a pastor has great indirect experience by seeing the same patterns again and again and again with countless couples. And you're right. He gets very explicit. And he's even talking about, I mean, men and women, again, similar but different. Our arousal curves are different. Physiologically, it's different. Uh, I mean, the, the joke is often told that women are more like crockpots and men. The men are more like microwaves mm -hmm. that a, a guy can go from start to finish much faster than a woman. And so what that means is the man has to be a disciplined and unselfish lover mm -hmm. uh, to, to make anything like um, what you're talking about happen. Yeah. Let's go to your resentment piece, though, because yeah. I, I love that section. It compares it to sloth. Which <laughs> sloth is like my favorite of the deadly sins. I mean, sloth, um, you know, Aquinas defines sloth as, yeah, yeah, we all think it's laziness, and that's partly true, but it's really kind of a spiritual apathy. Yeah. Uh, Aquinas defines it as sorrow at the difficulty of a spiritual good. So sorrow is like, I want to be great, I want to climb the mountain, but it's just too hard, mm. and so I'm sad, and so I kind of just roll over and die and give up, and then I look for outlets like pleasure or entertainment, you might think social media here, or I become a workaholic, anything mm -hmm. to kind of numb the pain. And so, but the thing with sloth is it still recognizes the good as a good. It's like, I, I'd like to be great. I'd like to do, but I, I just, it's too hard. And so I'm sad, but resentment goes further. Resentment says it's not even good. The good is only, as he puts it in that section, the good is only what suits me, what I find convenient. And that is poison to the spiritual moral life. And it reminds me so much of, a connection that I've uh, yeah, I've often wondered. I mean, not directly, but C.S. Lewis' Screwtape Letters, where he talks about the four causes of laughter, if you recall that, mm -hmm. uh, of, of joy, um, yeah, joy, um, fun, the joke proper, and then flippancy. The yeah. fourth one, flippancy, where basically he's like, look, any only a clever human can tell a real joke. Anybody can talk as if virtue were funny. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this flippancy here in Lewis is the same as resentment here in LNR. Okay. Yeah. It's where I deny the goodness of the good. And I say, and with chat, you know, it's when you make fun of chastity because that what it does is it, it's a coping mechanism. Why would I make the effort to try to live it out if I've already made fun of it and showed you how stupid and ridiculous it is? Yeah. And there's a temptation that I think back. I remember years ago, Kristalina and I were speaking at a high school and before the assembly, she went into the ladies room to just check her hair or makeup or whatever. And she goes in there. And a group of about a half dozen, you know, four or five uh, high school girls go in and they're all in the sink together. They have no idea she's the chastity speaker. And they come in and they are just tearing it apart. Oh, the stupid chastity talk we have to hear in five minutes. That's so they and, they and they're just ripping it to shreds. They have no idea she's about to get on stage. And they're right next to her and they're just doing their mascara or whatever the heck they do in there. I don't know, on their couches or whatever they have. And then she just kind of smiles when she's all done, kind of walks out the door. Girls come out and they end up sitting in the front row of the auditorium and then they introduce the speakers and Crystal walks out and these girls just oh, kind of melt into their seats. Um, but then afterwards, they all came up to her like in tears, realizing it was time to change. And as much as they resented the message of chastity before, once they learned that this is the virtue that frees you to love, this is the virtue that frees you to know if you're authentically being loved, they desired it. It's like Steve Jobs said that people don't know what they want until you show it to them. And so John Paul had this uncanny ability to be like, boom, here's the beauty of authentic love. And kind of the name of the show is that lust is boring. And well, this is why. And one of the lines that John Paul II said that we can kind of ruminate on, he says, a woman rather wants to suffer love. And by suffer, he means in the philosophical sense of receive. So a woman rather wants to receive love so that she can love a man rather wants to love so that he can receive love. Now, let me reread that just for you listening because this is something to chew on. So the woman rather wants to receive love so that she can love, whereas the man wants to love so that he can receive love. You think of this in the dynamics of a marriage or even of a dating relationship, a healthy sense uh, versus an unhealthy. Like some girls like, well, 
I'm only going to sleep with him, you know, if, if he can understand that, you know, this shows him how much I love him. And so she wants to receive it so that she can, you know, reciprocate. Whereas the man, in an unhealthy sense, might be expressing romantic words or affections or gifts or whatever so that he can receive love for her. So in a broken sense, she might be giving him sex for the sake of feeling love while he's giving her love for the sake of getting the sex. And so there's a twisted way, but then there's a healthy way that we can enter into this of receive. Okay, well... My wife needs to receive my love, and that will free her to love in return. Whereas a man, by me initiating that gift of love towards her, I, in turn, can receive her love. And if I'm just sitting around waiting for her to love me, and she's sitting around waiting for the opposite to happen, the dynamics are a bit skewed in the relationship. So any thoughts on that? Oh, it's like, well, who goes first? Well, whichever one of you is more mature, right? <laughs> uh, it reminds me of like the love languages and, and just a lot. And, and you just, you know, generally this is, this is, this, this plays out quite a bit where, uh, I mean, uh, again, I, you want to be careful with stereotypes, but, but these trends tend to be true enough that they're worth paying attention to. I mean, the, the phrase like you mentioned there that a woman will often use uh, sex to get love and a man will often use love to get sex. That happens enough that we want to pay attention to it. A man wants a battle to fight. It's not that women don't, but a man really wants a battle to fight. And, and you know, what are men thirsting for? Um, I mean, yes, it's love, but it's also respect, success, victory. I want to kill something and bring it home and show you that I did something. I want to feel my worth that way. And women will have similar desires too, no doubt, but they often also want to be loved. They want to know that they're enough, that they're worthy, that they're worthy of someone pursuing them and choosing them. They want to be known, loved. They want to be seen and heard. Um, and so just kind of be attentive to how these things play out. Uh, and I've seen this in my own marriage that, um, you know, if I'm not attentive to Sarah's you know, emotional needs. If too much time goes by and I'm kind of just doing my own thing, she doesn't really care about how successful I am or what I say. look, honey, look what I killed. I brought home for you. Yeah. Whereas if there's a connection emotionally, she's just much more invested and interested in what I might have to say. And that's, that's just human dynamics, but that's also plays out in the bedroom, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the same thing, it, it's a whole, with JP2, it's a holistic thing. There's not like compartments, like here's that, here's that. No, it's all of a piece. And you either make of your life a gift or your love turns to kind of needy egoism that is really self-love in disguise, whether you recognize it or not. Yeah, and before we close, I, I do want to spend a moment on Jan Tiranowski. You know, this oh. this layman, I mean, because we talk about John Paul having such an influence on others, uh, but many had an influence on him. In particular, this this layman, um, single guy, never got married, a little bit socially awkward from what I understand, but a, a true mystic. The guy would spend like four hours in the morning in prayer. Uh, and John Paul said that he was able to accomplish all things by the, the gravity or the weight of his interior life. Also introduced John Paul II um, more deeply into Carmelite spirituality, the true devotion to Mary. So maybe talk a little bit about the, the impact of the lay person on the spiritual development and thought of St. John Paul II. Yeah, one, one of my favorite things is to talk, is to kind of see the the radiation of holiness from JPT forward, but also there's a lot of people behind the scenes that help make him the man that he is. A lot of unsung heroes, and my students love to learn about them. I mean, one obvious one is Tiranovsky. My students mm -hmm. love Tiranovsky. Uh, he's buried in St. Stanislaus Koska, as you know, in, in, in uh, Krakow. And I mean, I, when we with my students, when I took them there, I didn't have to tell the story. I'm like, here he is. They're just weeping, just weeping. So this guy, born around 1900, um, he's always a Catholic, but in 1935, he had he uh, he's at the Salesian parish, and he hears the Salesian give this homily and say it's not difficult to be a saint. And for whatever reason, that line just pierced his heart. So in 1935, he goes all in with the Lord, dives deep into Carmelite spirituality, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, and, and the thing is, he doesn't know what's around the corner. I mean, he changed the world. But he was only able to because of his yes in 1935 when he did know what it was about. Like the yes now prepares us for the heroic moments later. And then he ends up dying in 1947, shortly after the war. So it's like his mission in life happened because he went all in before he knew it was happening. Mm -hmm. And he died a, He died single. He never got married. Um, and so my students really like rave about him as a single who didn't simply like – wish away his single time didn't mm -hmm. say gosh my life is a mess my life is terrible i mean it's okay to dream it's okay to dream i know this is so hard but there is a point where our whole lives are a gift our whole lives are a gift and we have to be open to god surprising us and, and open to the possibility that 
maybe our lives won't turn out exactly as we dream them up, but that may be for something beautiful and glorious that we just can't see right now. And that was the case for him. So um, in 1941, May of 41, so the parish that he went to, St. Casca, is the same one that Wojtyla and his dad attended when Wojtyla moved from Badovice to Krakow to attend the Jagiellonian University. Uh, they met around February of 1940. In May of 41, the Nazis overrun this parish. They ship off almost all the Silesians to concentration camps. I mean, one of them is this blessed Josef Kowalski, 31 years old. He is in, in Auschwitz. The Nazi officer said, we want you to grind these rosary beads with your foot. He says no, and they drown him in a barrel of feces. I mean, this, this these are the young priests forming the college-age Wojtyla. When that happens, and this is a Silesian parish, so lots of youth outreach. Youth outreach now has to devolve to lay people, and the you know, the most notable of whom is Tiranovsky. And so Tiranovsky at this time starts what he calls the living rosary, mm -hmm. gathers groups of 15 young men uh, that they would pray the rosary, but he also gave them formation and virtue, deep uh, spirituality. I mean, this is the time of the Nazi occupation. I mean, this is a time that's so horrific and unstable and predictable. Um, by 1943, he has 60 men in this group, 10 of whom became priests. I mean, and one of whom is Wojtyla, like, and he dies in 47, shortly after the war. So it's like this guy changed the world in horrific times, was single, wasn't resentful, um, but just just be, was faithful to what the Lord gave him in the moment. And whenever Wojtyla, so Wojtyla, one of his first articles for uh, the kind of journal magazine called Tagatne Pawczekny, uh, which was what, like the only kind of Catholic publication you could trust in communist Poland, uh, it was called The Apostle on Tiranowski. Whenever Wojtyla thought of the universe called the holiness or the lay apostolate, his shining example was always Tiranowski. Uh, what did Wojtyla write his dissertation on in Rome? John of the Cross, the influence of Tiranowski. I mean, Tiranowski, Wojtyla was convinced that Tiranowski was a saint, and he's now servant of God, mm -hmm. just one of one of my heroes. Um, and again, it's just, it just spectacular what he did behind the scenes in the small ways. And what they say about him is he didn't teach the faith as an idea. He knew the living God and you wanted to be around him, even though he was, wasn't like super cool guy. wasn't just like Jim Caviezel was just like on fire for the Lord and loved and wasn't afraid and wasn't afraid to be creative in a really dark time. And again, my students just fall head over heels in love with him, love to pray at his tomb, his remains in St. Stanislaus Costco. One of my favorite places to go, it's not a beautiful church, but because he's there. Yeah. One of the things that you were saying about just, you know, he wasn't wallowing kind of in that isolation and, you know, oh, woe was me, woe was me. You know, he was making a gift of himself. When I was in Chestahova, spending a little time in front of that sacred image of Our Lady of Chestahova, um, aesthetically, I've never really felt drawn to it before. A lot of times European art where they have a painting and they just encrust it with gold and diamonds and da 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 da, da. Like it just, to me, it's the, the Baroque style in a sense is kind of like, okay, I get it. Some people like it. I'm kind of into different stuff. But something just struck me so deeply as I was spending some prayer in there. You know, you've got this darkened image of Our Lady that's centuries and centuries old. She's got these scars on her cheek from some Hussite swordsman, I think in like the 14th century, we hit the image and it's so dark from probably all the candles that have been burnt before it in devotion. You could like even kind of hardly make out the features, but it's in framed in just this, the, the jewels and the gold and all this stuff. And to me, I, I really just fell in love with the image while I was there of just how much suffering and glory go together of just how beautifully they fit together. And so often we just want all the jewels. We just want all the glory. We want all that stuff. But God wants it to be together. And Christian Christianity is that religion where these two things are supposed to be wed together. And we, we're always wanting, like, how do I get that discomfort, that annoying thing out of my life? But God's like, I want it there. And maybe for him, it was the singleness that he continually offered to God. But you think of that life of this, this simple man getting up and spending four hours in prayer in the morning. It was like the president of our university, Franciscan University, Father Mike Scanlon, he did the same. He'd get up and he'd spend four hours in prayer in the morning before he started any work because he didn't want to do a single thing until he knew what God wanted him to do that day. And that's what St. John, I think it was St. John Chrysostom talked about, like if we spent even half of the amount of time that we spend in all our apostolic endeavors just in prayer, we would do so much more good for the church, an example for souls, but we're so hell-bent on just production and, you know, quantity, quantity and numbers and, you know, fruitfulness that we just want to be so successful that we're missing the opportunity to be truly fruitful. Hmm.
Oh, so well said. I mean, you know, one of his five loves from your book, I mean, the cross, suffering. Yeah. I really think one of the greatest causes for loss of faith today is just busyness. I mean, yeah. the frenetic pace of modern life. It, 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 when I have a student come to me and says, you know, I'm really struggling with my faith. I'm just doubting. Like, I always ask first, I'm like, when was the last time you went outside at night and looked up at the stars? When was the last time you cultivated that awe and wonder you had as a yeah. child? Uh, and, and I'm not anti-social media. I mean, what we're doing right now is because of technology, but um, you know, to step away every now and then and to not yeah. let all our quiet moments be consumed by that. I, I give in my moral life class a 48 hour tech fast and they always complain about it. I mean, they, you know, it, it's, I won't go to the details now, but so many of them by the end, they always report reduced anxiety. They report mm -hmm. better, better conversations. They offer like, I couldn't believe how much everybody else is on their phones. Yeah. And many of them will say, you know, I hope to do this again someday. And, and it's, it's such a 180 from when they started to, you know, when they hear about the assignment and then they do it. Um, yeah, I, I, you're just you're just so right. Um, our Lord wants to heal us, but He's also going to redeem us, and He's going to redeem us not by going around the cross and not our own crosses, but going through them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, as you described, Father Michael Scanlon, like this is JB too. I mean, yeah. commitment to prayer. Uh, it's just such a temptation, even for Christians, to kind of instrumentalize the faith. Yeah. What are the numbers? What's you know? It's like no, 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 no. Yeah. Don't forget why. I'm talking to myself. Why you're here. Yeah. Yeah. Now, speaking of falling in love with the faith, I understand you've got a new program, book, video coming out. Could you tell listeners a little bit about that? Yeah. So it's with Ascension. Uh, so it's a book with Marcelino D'Ambrosio and I called What We Believe, The Beauty of the Catholic Faith. It's an overview of the entire Catholic faith. And it's also a, a video series. Uh, and you can get the whole thing, the book, workbook, and online video access for only $30 at ascensionpress.com, ascensionpress.com. Uh, so it's a book, an overview of the faith, and, and it's the people I work with, were, I mean, Marcelino is amazing. If you know Marcelino, he's a, a scholar of the Church Fathers, just a heart for ministry, a heart for where people are, and just really is, has an, a, an ability to teach the faith in a way that's just so compelling, makes you want to to not only think, but pray and live it out. And, and Christianity is, is a way of life, right? Not just an idea. Um, and then the videos were shot in Rome. So we, oh. we, we basically on the book, um, went through the whole Catholic faith all over Rome with this incredible camera crew. I mean, it's, uh, again, it's, I'm not trying to brag, it's not about me, it's stunning. And so in the videos, it's me, Marcelino, and my wife, Sarah. And, and Sarah just, you know, as you know, I mean, she just brings something different to the table. Um, in just a really compelling, insightful way to kind of, again, not just learn about the faith, but how do we live it? Uh, how do we become disciples who are full of peace and joy, who aren't afraid of the cross, aren't afraid to pray, get on our knees, aren't afraid to serve, get our hands dirty, um, and just kind of rekindle that spiritual boldness that the Gospels and Acts of the Apostles, Hebrews, that this kind of parousia is the Greek word, this boldness where we just know we are loved by the Father and we are called and chosen and commissioned. And let's just live life not afraid. So what we believe, the beauty of the Catholic faith, uh, Ascension Press, it's available now. I like the fact that you're leading in with beauty. Uh, you know, of the transcendentals, that's the one you can't argue with. I mean, you can argue with what's good, you can argue with what's true, but you know, beauty is irrefutable. And so uh, if, if people listening or watching uh, on YouTube want to get more information, I'm going to put some links in the show notes to the course link, uh, the trailer video for the program, uh, how to sign up for a free preview, where you can connect with Ascension and Doc Swaff on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that's going to be on the show notes. Now, also in the show notes, uh, Dr. Swafford had mentioned a moment ago how much the students benefited just by unplugging for 48 hours from social media, how much they grew in two days. Um, try 90 days. Uh, I, I know. I imagine you've probably done X's 90. I've done it. Um, we're gonna have a link in the bottom there for X's 90. This is a basically a three-month program for guys on just detoxing from the world and just immersing themselves in fellowship. And there's asceticism that you need in your life, and this builds it in there for you. But man, after those 90 days, you're a changed man. And so check out Exodus 90. Also want to thank our other sponsor, Hallo, the Hallo app. Um, I mean, I've got it on my phone. I use it regularly. Um, please go, go check this thing out because by downloading the app and, and using it, you can try it for free there at the link below. Um, you're supporting Hallo, which tells and it helps them to support us in this podcast and you get some free time on an app to check that out as well and also covenant eyes um this is accountability software want to put uh, a good word in for them if you've got teenagers or you're, you're a young adult you need accountability um to stay you know good online so that it's not going lone ranger when it comes to breaking free i mean i get emails every single week of people struggling with this 
And more often than not, the people that aren't making the progress are people who don't have accountability in their lives. So whether it's Exodus 90 or Covenant Eyes, it's ways to build accountability in your life. I want to also thank everybody who supports the program on Patreon. There's a link below if you want to support us on that. If this ministry has been a gift to you, um, you can make a monthly gift there. Get all kinds of free stuff also. And then also click for free. We've got an ebook um, that's a summary of the book I, we just discussed, St. John Paul the Great's Five Loves. We've got a summary of the chapter on human love that you click and get there as well. But most of all, check out those links to Dr. Swafford's works, social media, uh, and the good stuff that he's doing at Benedictine University. Or even better, just go to Benedictine University, sit in on one of his classes, enjoy it. Uh, you'll fall in love with St. John Paul II just as we have. So Doc Swaff, thank you for coming on the show. Keep up the amazing work. Oh, thanks so much, Jason. Blessing to be with you. Thank you. Likewise.